Hey, welcome to Atomic Life. This is Kurt Havens, and today we're here with Coach Colton. What's going on, man? How you doing? Not too much, man. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. I'm good, man. We're Long both sick. Before. Yeah, we're both, which is rare. I don't think either <laughs> of us ever get sick. Yeah, never ever before. So we were, um, we were planning on doing a thing on uh, digestion and some yeah. interesting stuff with estrogen, but we started talking about oh my um, gosh. just Everything. like the the stuff that goes on in social media. I think we were just yeah. gonna we could just capture some of this first and then go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, and, and so like what what I was talking to Kurt about was like, man, I've had we've had some weird comments recently, and. I, we all get them, you know, everyone gets them and we share them and we're talking about them is like, why, where do these come from? But, you know, what's, what's interesting is, especially when you coach people, you have to be so careful because they can be your biggest enemies, especially where you get really emotional, really close to a show. If you're not working with the right people, you, I mean, this is, you have to vet the people you work with. And I learned this lesson last year, like really hard. Right. And, it, like when someone gets close to a show and they're highly emotional and then all of a sudden they don't get the placing they want by a small margin, you're the, you're the person at fault and they are going to tell everybody and they're going to say everything that they can about you in a negative light, no matter how much you work you did for them, you know? Um, and it's like the, the reflection of that, I, I don't know if they feel it or the impact of that. And it's not necessarily like my business is going to hit from that, right? I understand like it's not necessarily a good principle to have people running around saying bad things, but it's more that it's like a, for me, it's like an internal sort of um, battle that I have because I've spent so much time. I'm on the calls. I'm, I'm building the programs. I'm, I'm there in person, you know, and then this person goes around and, and it, it happens so often. And before I just kind of, shrugged it off and was like whatever and then this last time I was like I really have to be more considerate of like who I'm putting on my team and and helping out because it's it's like those comments get so vile and I tend to ignore them really well but every once in a while when they <laughs> there's some that gets you you know and they they're yeah. like they dig in and it's it's really interesting because you harbor those comments yeah. for a long time like you know people like to kind of talk shit on the internet and say like one person might say one thing and then another person comes back with another thing. But the reality is, is sometimes you say something and that person will harbor that thing for years. And, and that's a haunting, uh, this is, I, I post and ghost a lot, which I'm really bad at, which I'll, I'll post on social media and then I won't respond to anything. <laughs> so okay. I miss out on a lot of things, but, uh, it's for that reason, because sometimes if I expose myself to comments and stuff, it just it gets too overwhelming. And I find myself spending an hour and a half, dumping into something that's completely irrelevant to the things that I'm doing. And, you know, it provides me no benefit at the same time. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you said that. So I think why I wanted to record that is I, for, for me, it's, it's a newer thing, right? I've only been public for a couple months yeah. and it's it, as, as I grow, you get more and more of this stuff. And I'll, it's, I think it takes a toll. At least it takes a toll on me and I'm, not that I'm glad to hear it takes a toll on you. But I'm glad that I'm not alone in that because I think that there are days that like you read some of this stuff and you're like, wow, that's yeah. really rough. Like it's ruined many of my days. Like I have to spend less time, I think, reading some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. I, I Some of it I think is just the translation in text, right? Just people yeah. don't know how to communicate. But sometimes they're just awful people online that just really, I'm not sure. It's like that Mike Tyson saying about getting punched in the face. It's like there's, because there's like a wall that people were willing to say these things. Mm -hmm about us yeah. it's odd right yeah they have there's the anonymity an anonymity they have it's like they can they can say things without having a direct like in the same room of course they would never say and i've you know i've met people who have talked poorly about me when at the olympia or arnold mm -hmm. or something you know and it's like they're the nicest people in the world to me and there's no issues but it's like oh, online for some reason it's just like this huge hostility and everyone has a really big ego and it's overly inflated and everyone wants to express their opinion because they follow a specific thought leader, for instance, uh, code yeah. name B or yeah. somebody else, you know, and, and then they sort of adopt this belief system and then put it on to other people. And if it's not really? the same belief system, if there's a mismatch, it's immediate, like autoimmune response, attack, attack. And it's really unfortunate, but because yeah. you and I put in work, I mean, we're putting in work to do this stuff, right? It's not just like, you and I being here right now, it's not just like free labor per se, right? Like it, yeah. it takes time, time yeah. it takes and effort. research. Yeah, and it's and it's like a passion. It's a passion, and so 
if I was to go into an, an art museum where there was a local art, art exhibit and say, this looks like shit, this looks like shit, this is why it looks like shit, because someone told me that this isn't the way you draw shit. And it's like, who the fuck are you to tell me this isn't yeah. how you draw shit? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but people don't look at what we do in the same light, but it is the same, right? right? I mean, the hours, I mean, it, I, I know you do, you do an equal, if not more reading than I do. You're probably yeah. one of the most well-read people I know. It, it's wild, like how much time this stuff takes, some of this content, yeah. right? And then people, you know, tear it apart. They do it on Instagram, on YouTube. I think YouTube is probably worse. TikTok is probably, oh, for sure. TikTok is probably the worst because the market, the, uh, yeah. I, I don't do much on TikTok for that reason. No, but, it's not even worth um, it. It's, the, uh, it. Yeah, it's brutal. But I, with that said, I feel like we just keep moving forward, right? I think right. we're kind of, you and I are in a, a, a really interesting circle of people that have the same kind of positive uh, outlook yeah. on the things. And it's, it's really neat. At least for me, it's very cool to be part of this now, mm. you know, and kind of drive forward and just ignore all the garbage and the bad yeah. stuff. Like I, I know one of my missions is to kind of undo a lot of the bad science that's out there, you know, yeah. created by some of those I think people. That's awesome. that, you know, I just, it, it, that, I think that's what really drove me in the beginning is I was just frustrated listening to some of this stuff. And I was like, that's just not true. Right. You know? Right. And it's constantly perpetuated. And so when you can come in and handle it appropriately, I think that's a really big thing. Like yeah. not out lash and be a, aggressive and literally emotional. Bully, but yeah. yeah, highly emotional, you know, have this hyper volatility to you. But, you know, come in and be someone who's trying to piece the things together that everyone else is kind of pulling apart. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it, and on that note where you're you're kind of coming in with the real science and people are pushing back the 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 best what i love about this group we're in is like the best filter is the people closest to you yeah and so if everyone else is like hey man this is a sick video or like todd comes and texts me man that video you just put out was so cool like that was wild it's, you know, huge. Like, you know, it's, it's huge. like yeah it's like okay now i know there's some validation in what i did and like this yeah. random guy, like, you know, 69, 240, whatever. <laughs> says, on YouTube, it doesn't matter to me. You know? No, I'm with you. No, I'm more when, when you and I talk and, and you and I jive on something, I'm, I'm more, I'm more flattered by that than I am from audience feedback. Yeah, right. Because like, I'm more impressed by your thought process of this stuff. And I yeah. think something else that people don't understand is none of us know all the answers. Like no. anyone who proclaims that they know, you know, again, I don't mean to pick on the one person that says that, but <laughs> it's just, it's a ridiculous concept, right? I feel like mm -hmm. the more it's the Dunning-Kruger effect, the more I learn about yeah. this stuff, the less I know. And the more focus, like my focus and research is so narrow at this point that I don't know a lot of, you know, the broad stuff. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you probably have a better grasp of a lot of the, the stuff that I just, I can no longer look at. Yeah. You know, but or it's we getting to the... Way point where like compartmentalization is super important because I you know now I'm getting really into business and that's a whole other side of like research and understanding how taxes work and relocating businesses to different states or countries and hiring you know there's so many different components of it right and so it's like okay now I have to I'm researching one thing which is like this business spectrum I'm, I'm researching you know androgen sciences whatever that you know umbrella means and I'm researching you know, uh, nutritional sciences, which I find in particular really interesting. And it's like, okay, I have all this like wide degree of information, but what's happening is like, I'm a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And so like, I know a little bit of everything, but not enough amplitude of anything, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I know enough to be very well versed in most things, but in particular things, I'm like, man, I wish I had time to learn more. Like if I could just sit in a black box and someone <laughs> pays me and feeds me and like, you know what I mean? I would be so happy. Like that would, my autistic brain would run wild. I'd be so I, happy. I feel like where it goes wrong though, and it's what I find is like, because I focus on, I hyper focus on like one, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just androgen. Then I tend to push out the other stuff in my brain. Yeah. Like we're all forget. Like we'll start looking at like these motor complexes, like you and I would talk about. And like, I learned it. I, I don't use it anymore outside yeah. of like serotonin maybe. So it's like, I'm not comfortable anymore talking about it. Right. And you start to yeah. second guess yourself too with this stuff. Right. Yeah. You know? It's, it's kind of the way I can relate it is uh, it's like your, your vitamin cabinet. Sometimes I look through there and I'm like, why the fuck am I taking this again? And like, <laughs> I have to look at my notes and remind like, myself. That's like, why. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, when you research so many things, it's like, 
fuck, dude. Like, how do I, I don't get know, here? Yeah. <laughs> like your brain just becomes a catacomb. You're like, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. No, it's wild. And you never know. Like we did a cool, v a, another video on growth hormone on Chase. I Irons. saw that. That yeah. was really cool. So, but, and, and again, like, I guess, you know, at least according to Todd, like Todd considers me like the expert on growth hormone. And I guess in theory, like I would possibly be one of them. I don't like to take credit for things like that, but, um, someone there were some really interesting comments there that really threw me for a loop yeah. and it was like wow okay and so like i really had to step back for a second and think about what i had said what mistakes i made in that like how my i had like flawed thinking for you know mm -hmm. for parts of it and stuff like that stuff's wild like yeah i don't you probably get that too where i re, where you revisit things and you're like man what was i oh, doing yeah. like, i know that that wasn't right oh yeah yeah, that one in particular was super interesting where I, I believe there was a comment on like the different um, kill adults for like, yeah, yeah. And I, I, that like thought process is like, dude, I don't even like there is so much to this. Like, and what does that represent in in, in physiological terms, like having different kill adults? Just for, wait. Yeah, right. Wait. Like and so where it gets funny, too, is and where it threw me for a loop is the one where he's talking about the different isoforms. Yeah. Is the dash one like is technically 217 amino acids long. But the reason why is because if you like, and my, my brain had to like do backflips for a second. So growth hormone starts at 20 phenylalanine 27 and goes to two, you know, whatever, 227. And so it, it is 192 in there. It just doesn't start mm -hmm. one. So it's like kind of a trip to think about because I'm looking at it first yeah. and I'm like, that isoform doesn't make any sense. Like you couldn't use that in the human body, but he was right. It's like sometimes he's a, he's some sort of physical uh, protein chemist. So he would be very specific in that stuff. Whereas right. like, I learned like a little bit of it yeah. and then you move on to something else. Yeah. So like, we all have such little, we all, we're all specialized at one little thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, that's not like, I understand growth hormone as a whole, but like when it comes down to like the molecular weights of it, it's like, <laughs> I never had to deal with that. I'm not making it. Right. You know? Right. So my that stuff was wild. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. But it's cool to see that see that kind of feedback I find fascinating. I said something to Chase about that. I was like, wow, you have a super intelligent audience. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's I, it's interesting that they gravitate towards like Chase and then you're catching on to them from Chase's audience, you know. I guess. Yeah. I don't have an, I haven't had that level of comments yet. And I'm now I'm almost fearful of that level. <laughs> you make me think you know, I have to think about everything I say is to be perfect. It's yeah. like, I don't even know, like I read that, like Paul sent me that a, a screenshot of that and then Chase sent it to me because they all wanted me to respond to it. And I was like, man, that's really, Damn. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> that's really tough. I don't know who this guy is, but he definitely is a stuff together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, he wasn't wrong. And I think that that's, that's kind of, I, I alluded to it in my book and we're going on all these tangents. I, I talked about, I think part of the problem with some of the China, I don't think there's really an issue between Chinese generic growth hormone and, and pharma. I, I think it's possibly in the handling of it. Who knows? I think if it starts out as growth hormone, it's growth hormone. What does it matter? I think where, where it could go wrong, wrong is if it is one of those different weight growth hormones. Like if it's, if it's a different kill adult, it'll still interact with the receptor, but it's just not going to cause any gene transcription. Right. right. So it might elevate blood levels, but who knows what happens. And that's the interest because you have like there's instances that I can recall where I've had clients use generics, do the blood test, come back good. So good. Right. And the symptomology that they have is not relevant to someone who's taking as much as they would. So it's like, is that intracellular thing happening that we want to be? We, we don't know. know. Right. Yeah. And there's and then to test that, I mean, how much money are you gonna spend? And where are you gonna take that? <laughs> Because right. like you could take it, like I could take it, I could take it on near a bunch of the major pharmaceutical companies are here. I can't physically take outside samples in, right? Like they'd right. be marked for inventory. And like, what, what do you, what do you do with that stuff? You can't, you can't just be like, you can't, it's against the law. So you can't, right. you know, so it's, there's really no good way to test this stuff unless they're manufacturing it. So you could right. go to Emu Serrano technically and test Serastim there if you work for them. But right. outside of that, you can't test generic. Yeah, there's no way. I mean, there's no way who and yeah. unless you could really afford your own equipment, but I don't know who does that. At that point, you'd just be buying Pharma GH. Right. Why would you waste your time buying? Pharma? <laughs> I think that was the point of the video. Is I think it's just more consistent, right? Like I mm -hmm. think if you use Teresim, it's consistent. You should, assuming yeah. it's real, you should get a consistent result. You know, three I use is three I use is three I use right. on the board, right. and like you know, how you're gonna feel. Your hands go numb. Like mm -hmm. you're gonna lose that. 
almost regardless of what you eat, right? You're going to look 3D. It it's mm. and it's fast and it's dramatic. And then some of the other brands you see, you're like, I don't know if it's real or not. Right. When guys question if it's real. I'm like, something's wrong with it because it shouldn't yeah. be questionable. Yeah, yeah. Like that's a really really test. Right. You know it's real. Right. You you will like in uh, of course there's like issues because some of them play with diuretics and stuff like this happened with a, a brand called Thai Gear Walls in Thailand. We were using this myself, Nick and um, Adam, and we all had like exorbitant amounts of edema. And we're like, what the fuck is going on? And it, it just turns out there was probably some substance within the, the growth hormone pens that they were giving us, which were underground pens that was not growth hormone. It was likely some form of a, you know, antidiuretic or something to cause like a retensive effect. Or one of the fillers they used or something. 100%. Yeah. And, and when I've used, um, genotropins before, which was funny enough, when I started, um, my like journey into the non-natural realm, one of the first things I did was get on TRT and then use genotropin. And, um, the, the difference in body composition, even back then from using generics now is completely different. I could eat, 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 and eat, and it was like I was still grainy, and I and I was not like big, but I was grainy, and it was interesting. I mean, it was wildly interesting, and I thought there was something wrong with me for the longest time. Like, there's no way I'm going to grow mass because I'm like I'm just you this can't, you can't eat. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I came out eating that shit. I I, tr I explain to people I feel like the metabolic effects should be as strong as Trembolo minus those side effects. Right? Yeah, like yet yeah. you don't feel horribly ill all the time, but you you have the same kind of look, right? And right. you can just eat almost stronger than Tren, I would say, yeah. for the metabolic it's, effects. It's so really when guys are taking, you know, when they say they're taking five or six units of whatever other top or whatever, and they're not mm -hmm. getting much, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Clearly it's not probably, a great product. Right, it's probably not the the stuff you need to be using. And I, I actually answered an Instagram Q&A on my story about this. And I said nearly the similar thing. Someone asked me generics versus uh, pharma. And, and I said, well, with pharma, the guarantee is there. Like you use two IUs, you're going to get the amplitude of effect from two IUs. With generics, you use two IUs, and you might you might get zero, you might get one, you might get three. It, yeah, it's, it could be hot. Really yeah, it's, hot too. <laughs> it's, it's 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 hard to say. And so it's I prefer you know if I had the finances to once I move out of the country, I certainly will. But like get <laughs> a copious amount of serastim, like I'm doing that as opposed to you know putting my trust into a yeah. product which i virtually cannot test in like we were talking about intracellularly what's happening yeah well, it'd be cool to do todd and i've talked about this for we could always do it as a group we we're talking about possibly doing a like an experiment on ourselves and doing biopsies that'd be because then you can actually see what's going on in the muscle the yeah. biopsy needles are small now they're not nearly as scary right. looking as they used to be i mean i don't no. not that i not that it's fun but like take a little piece of your quad kind of be right. cool just to see what's I actually going on in the muscle yeah. right you you heard we talked about the the serum stuff it's all over the place right mm -hmm. i don't know where your serum mine tests even not on growth hormone mine tests super high like i'm a giant and yeah you know I'm, yeah i remember I'm, calling Todd's I'm, sure. is, I'm pretty sure todd's is always low yeah, yeah. Uh, and chase's is always low too mm -hmm. on, on 18 units of serastim his yeah. was like 150. <laughs> right. Right. Yet he grew by 60 pounds or something crazy. Yeah. Like it's obvious it was effective. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't matter. So that's mm -hmm. like, you know, I get a lot of questions. You probably get similar ones about testing. Like, you know, I just got a kit. You know, I want to test it. I'm going to shoot right. 10 units intramuscular and then I'm going to go get blood work right now. Maybe that matters. Maybe it doesn't. Right. I don't know if it matters. Yeah. I mean, it'll it, tell it, you. An individual it might matter. Like it might matter for you. Like, for Colton, if you're normally 150 and you go and you test and you're 300, you clearly something is, right. again, is it still, is it actually making an effect? We don't know. But at least it shows that like there's some growth hormone in there. Yeah. Versus like me versus you, what is that? It doesn't prove anything. Yeah. Like I can be yeah, on TRD nice. and have a acromegaly level of growth hormone because of my kidney yeah. and it doesn't show, it's not showing anything per se. It's not like right. I'm growing from it. Right. Yeah. It's not it's treating it. It's also like, uh, you know, I, I found too that specifically with androgens, you have androgen receptor density. So some individuals react differently to much different doses, but the same is true with growth hormone. And I think you have that wild variability as well. So again, it's like just using a descriptive dose is hard to say what effects you'll get. 
Um, yeah. Or like saying, if I take 10 IUs and measure my growth hormone, is that going to be equivalent to a good result, I guess. But no one knows, right? Yeah. And that's where we go with like, not to go even on deeper tangent, but that's where, you know, with the androgen receptor density is really what dictates the outcome. It's like, mm -hmm. why like a guy like a Flex Wheeler or Ronnie yeah. Coleman will respond where you and I, you and I probably respond better than, we're definitely on the, the right side of that bell curve, but we're not, but not nearly as well. are not freaks by any means, yeah. but we're better responders than most. Right. And I think that that's it. That fit is not the androgen load. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why guys don't understand, you know, maybe a guy like Lee Priest was telling the truth. Maybe he really used 400 milligrams a deca. Right. And he looked like that. Who the hell knows? Yeah. I mean, I mean I, and seeing him when he was like in his teens, like 14. Yeah. Well, that's kind of why I believe him. Like, yeah. It's probably some know, valid. I mean, there's, there's guys on the Olympia stage now that don't look as good as Priest did when he was 16. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. So, yeah. Like you could probably hold his own as a kid. Yeah. You could go you know, into that physique category and probably smash it, you know. Yeah. And that's why, you know, and again, I'm sure you're the same way. I have clients that are on all different varying amounts and they mm -hmm. all get varying results. Like right. I have one pro in particular who uses a very low amount of androgens and he's huge. Yeah. Huge. And Absolutely. he's never used growth hormone. He's never used insulin. And, and, the pro, and he compete and he competes in a lot of pro level shows. We could talk about him after if you want. I don't I don't know if you want to say, but like I, I'm always shocked at the low amounts, and we joke about it. He's like, yeah, if I could afford more, maybe <laughs> he doesn't need any more. You know, yeah. silly amounts, like stuff that a kid a kid at a local gym would use more than this guy, and he's a beast. Yeah. Like we work out together sometimes, and he he draws attention. He's that big. Wow, that's crazy. That's so crazy. You know. I'm less than a gram, whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, it's wild. But yeah, do you want to, uh, we could change gears and go into digestion if you want. Yeah, man, there's there's a, a lot we can cover, but I can also do it relatively simply. I just think it's, it's important to talk about some of these things um, because I think a lot of, it's a, it's a flashy word, digestion. Like you hear it a lot as a bodybuilder or in, in the fitness realm in, in general, you hear digestion this digestion that you need a probiotic prebiotic a postbiotic a, you know you need fiber you need this thing you need that thing you need all these different components of digestion to be in good health and not many people will exclusively expand on what is the digestive process good or bad or somewhere neutral okay so you know it's 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 a big thing for me to like classify the components of digestion i think one of those is the migrating motor complex which we kind of talked about um, and I've, I've discussed this in length before, but there's this fundamental flaw that a lot of bodybuilders can make with this in um, the, the migrating motor. I guess I should explain. Perhaps yeah, we can talk about what it is because I don't know if most people probably don't get that. Right. So the migrating motor complex is essentially this. Um, it's this like gastrointestinal sort of um, contraction that happens from your stomach all the way down to your colon out your asshole, right? So um, essentially inter digestive states or between meals, you are not eating and consuming food. And so your body commits to this migrating motor complex, which is like a, a, a peristaltic wave, essentially like yeah, it's an electrical um, impulse, basically, right? And, yeah, and you're, you're slowly pushing everything through. Um, and even like a little bit of enzymatic fluids are released too to cleanse the walls of the GI. Um, and, and essentially its purpose is to clear out the stomach and small intestine from bacteria that is not supposed to be there and other byproducts as well. Because it'll go back up and start to grow. Right, right, right. And that's, that's you know, where things like SIBO, small intestinal bacteria come from and various other issues, even um, uh, GERD can come from, which we'll touch mm -hmm. on in a bit. But very, very important to understand that um, this process is like when you're hungry, and your, tum your, your tummy's rumbling like that growl, and that's the migrating motor that's complex. It. And it's activating, and it's pushing everything down. So the, the problem comes the, when bodybuilders are, especially in an off-season, um, and they're pushing food ev every two hours, maybe even more depending on who they are. You know, I've, I've heard stories of uh, Jay Cutler you know, doing 10 to 12 meals a day. Uh, I imagine, you know, much less time intermittently between you have to, unless you didn't sleep right <laughs> exactly so you're you know this this migrating motor complex happens about every uh 100 to 230 minutes interdigestively so almost essentially you can consider two hours between consuming meals 
Um, on average, there's a really good piece of data that shows a, a, about a 550 or 450 calorie meal will inhibit the migrating motor complex for about 213 minutes, plus or minus 48 minutes. So if you consider that, we're pounding food daily, right? And, and this is a, a big problem, again, when digestive comes into, the word digestion comes into play. Uh, your migrating motor complex becomes more and more inhibited. And what's happening is that bacteria that is normally getting sort of purified out and the enzymes that are also being um, secreted with that peristolic movement aren't aren't coming out either and so you have these bacteria that are slowly migrating themselves up the intestine to your sphincters causing them to even loosen in some instances um, things like h pylori mm -hmm. and what can result is what i believe at least is is that distended gut look that sort of discomfortable okay. you know high gas output like generally speaking there was a, a great meta analysis done that showed that you would you, about 17 to 18 um farts a day is kind of where you want to sit more anything more yeah. than that is a pretty big correlate to the digestive issues yeah. via dysbiosis um so you know people who are bodybuilders they're generally thinking i have digestive issues i'm farting a lot my shit is not where it needs to be you know, I use the Bristol stool chart to be a little yeah. bit more objective with stool um, and or they're, they're just not shitting at all. There, there could be different variants of this problem, but it's immediately a solution to take a probiotic or a prebiotic or up the Metamucil or do something else. Change the meal construction itself, um, which is great. And sometimes that can actually be a solution depending on what the food is, because independent food sources can affect the migrating water complex a little bit differently. Higher fats can slow it down yep. much more. Yep. Complex um, carbohydrates. Right, right, right. And so that can work. Um, but what I think is really key here is to prevent digestive issues, especially in a prolonged off season. I think really mitigating that overconsumption of carbohydrate fat and excessive and frequent food intake and John Meadows said this like five years ago, I think. Like he's like, bodybuilders should fast once a week. And he and, had gut, he had gut issues, right? Yes. He had surgery. Yeah. Okay. Right. So he was and, more aware of this stuff. Mm -hmm. He was very perceptual of like what was going on. And I think it's really interesting because I think that is honestly a very good tactic. And especially as we see smaller waists and like V tapers becoming more of a prominent feature within the top fives of each category. I think those kind of strategies are going to be really important to deploy for certain competitors, especially depending on what kind of look they're going for. Yeah. And, um, you know, virtually what happens is as you get these um, aerobic bacteria building up in the, the small, back, uh, small intestine because they're not being pushed out, you have a development of, of gas, right? And, and that sort of pushes out, bulges out the stomach. Mm -hmm. and, and as that happens, your transverse abdominus starts to weaken and, and starts to literally stretch. I mean, it becomes hypertrophic stretch. Exactly. And, and then what results is a permanent look to, to your stomach, which is distension. Um, so I think, you know, if, and it, it is really important, like calories are king. So eating is very essential. But I think the guidelines need to be like very simple, obviously, which is the stuff we practice, like, for the most part, follow a low FODMAP diet, you know, yep. uh, eat frequently, but good quality meals, but really, truly try to maybe switch it up every once in a while. Like I'm a huge fan of maybe going from six meals a day to four for two I do weeks, maybe you do a mini cut, you know? Um, and I find that those little intermittent periods of kind of stopping um, the overconsumption can be really helpful. Now, the other interesting thing with the migrating motor complex is it can also be inhibited by insulin. So insulin independently will slow the migrating motor complex because it doesn't all just happen at once. It doesn't start at the stomach and then just slowly make its way down to the, the large intestine. It, it kind of starts as like a um, compartmentalized situation where it's in the mm -hmm. stomach and then maybe it moves down to the small intestine and then maybe down to like the end of the colon. Um, or maybe it's like the end of the colon, the stomach, and then the small intestine. It's not really organized in that sense. But insulin independently will slow down that small intestine 
peristalsis. And so what you can see is with a high burden of fasting insulin or exogenous insulin being deployed very much in a or lantus, like too much lantus or something, right? It's a background. Yep, yep. You you get that uh, lack of the migrating motor complex again, it shuts down. And then, you know, we often, uh, or it is often correlated that insulin does cause a, a waste distension. And, okay. you know, that's the theory being in, in practice, maybe that's because of the migrating motor complex becoming less efficient. Okay. I never, I never actually thought of it in those terms. That's really, that's really cool. So something that I was playing with was the ideal that on, it, and it's probably on top of that. It's probably multifactorial. I would guess. I, I find that when we, as bodybuilders, we get closer to a show, right? We crush our estrogen. Which yeah. When you crush estrogen, yeah. bile production also slows down, right? You see this mm -hmm. in postmenopausal women where their stomach starts to get distended and they have digestion issues. And I don't know if you've ever driven, if you've ever pulled. It's dumb to do, and I don't know why people do it, but I've done it as well. If you pull testosterone and on top of that, yes. use an anti-estrogen, which <laughs> I don't know what I'm stopping from aromatizing, but if you do both, you will screw your gut up. Yeah. Like you won't. 100%. You, you actually can't contract your abs. Yeah. And, 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 and you, so you will not shit. Like you can take any laxative in the world and you will not shit. No. And You're it's really right. funny how that works to me because it's a very like you, you see this again resonated and, and perpetuated through sort of like the old coaching and and i you know blue taylor was my coach and i love blue taylor i have nothing bad against him but he is a very old school and that was his approach was like completely destroy estrogen like already be taking like two or three times the dht you are testosterone remove the testosterone and take an ai and take a serum you know do yeah. everything and possible you, and use a 19 or drive the estrogen is <laughs> horribly <laughs> yep. low yep and so it's just like by the end of that, I'm like, he's like, go eat a burger for you know, <laughs> you like, this, like, right? Like, what are you supposed to do about your stomach? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, this is basically going to be concrete being poured down my fucking throat, you know? Oh yeah, um, yeah, and that's that stuff is all so, and it's interesting because a, a part of this is is beta glucuronidase, you know, and, yeah. and how that, and we were just talking about how there's so right, right, and there's so little research on um beta glucuronidase unfortunately but it, it is seem somewhat causal to some instances of breast cancer in women and um, other variations of estrogen driven cancer mediated Probably cancer colon cancer. Mm -hmm, colon cancer yeah and, and um you know beta glucuronidase essentially is it deconjugates uh estrogen that's been conjugated by the liver okay. and when that happens it becomes reactivated in a sense so any of the estradiol estrone can be reactivated and then recirculated and so yep. you have this issue where you know and a lot of guys too this is this is why it's so multifactorial a lot of guys will have this um excessive expression of aromatization like they'll seemingly always have high estrogen even at 200 milligrams of testosterone and part of that probably is some form of gut dysfunction and certainly if you're seeing it in conjunction with like this sort of the features of a slow migrating motor complex okay. extension gas um you know a, a gerd especially there could be something to be correlated there for sure okay are you so that that's really an interesting point i'm seeing a lot of estrogen issues now in younger mm -hmm. guys which i think oh, is yeah. really fascinating that i never saw before so i you know i I've, I've been coaching since the 90s I'm older than I look, I guess. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it was not something that was as prevalent before, right? Like I, the standard was five or 600 milligrams. Maybe you need an AI, maybe you don't, you know, at a gram, yeah. you know, 750 to a gram, most guys need something. I'm right. finding a lot of younger guys now are needing an AI at 200 milligrams, 300 yeah. milligrams. Let me get a gyno. And I wonder if it's related to that to an extent is that the diet is screwed up, mm -hmm. right? And they're just reactivating estrogen. So basically, estrogen it gets another it hydroxylates and it goes back. And that's also depending on what form, it can also become a carcinogen. Yes, E4, yeah. E4, E4, E16. I think E4 is a carcinogen. When I should right. do that, um, and that's kind of what's occurring. That can occur, and that where the colon cancer or the breast cancer mm -hmm. can come from, right? But I think the simplest answer, right, is probably more fiber would probably help to an extent. Yeah. Right. The American diet is notoriously low in fiber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, are you yeah, finding yeah. with Sorry, like younger 
are you finding? I'm sorry. Are you finding this though with with guys out there now in your coaching? For sure. And this is like, honestly, it's it's very interesting because as a younger individual, like I'm 26 years old, so um, I, I do get approached by younger generations um, quite often, especially when they're looking to get a performance enhancement going, whatever that means for them. Right. Sometimes it's just something like extremely simple, non androgen related, but um, almost always almost always when even just on a um you know physiological dose of trt maybe slightly above like 200 milligrams uh administered multiple times a week not just like you know, one bullet, but like right yeah um still have massive like, i have one guy right now who he cannot tolerate 150 milligrams without um you know de developing symptoms of high estrogen and and it's funny because with him he actually uh, we did a gi map test and he had uh, candida and H. pylori over really? Yeah. Okay. So we're in the process of like working through that right now, but it seems like there is some prevalence with maybe it's, it's hard to say, because again, it's really multifactorial, but is it the abundant use of anti, uh, microbials in our environment today that are creating stronger, um, bacteria within our gut? Or is it that the children today aren't exposed to as much um bacteria by nature you know they're not playing in the earth they're not you know what i mean um and is it that or more babies are born now by c-section than ever before or the diets are different now because you know in 1990s people were eating potatoes rice chicken beef and now people are eating like your protein donuts and your <laughs> protein yeah, ice cream and, yep and so when, when i grew up so I'm almost twice your age. When I grew up, we still, I remember walking to a farm with my grandparents and where they live now is not a rural area anymore. It's yeah. become more developed, but this is in the seventies, like wow. in the 1970s, literally walking as a little kid to the farm Picking and meat. getting eggs and milk and stuff like directly yeah. from a farmer. And like, yeah. it seems like a hundred years ago at this point, like you would never do that. Where's our farm right. that is milk? I mean, you're, you're in Texas. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So you probably have more farms in New Jersey. There's not a whole lot of farms anymore. There's still not a lot here. There's still yeah. not a lot. And that's but, one of the, when I was in Europe, there was the whole infrastructure of like Bosnia, the country I was in was it, it's that, you know, everyone knows a farmer, everyone buys locally from the farmer. Uh, and there's a really good uh, set of data done where it, it showed that children born in agriculture um, had more diverse microbia than sure. children born in industrialized areas, which is, it's kind of obvious, but it's super interesting. And there's, there's something to say there. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's gotta be something with the food, right. And a connection with mm -hmm. this. I just, the estrogen thing too, with, um, with aromatase and, and the hyper expression of it, I I'm with you. I don't think it's like a polymorphic thing. I don't think we've we haven't changed our DNA in that way. I just think that there's something external, right? Like epigenetic yeah. kind of response. There's also that, uh, I'm not going to say the name, that virus that was going around for a couple of years. Yeah. It was a big world thing. I don't know if you've seen the data, but there's a direct correlation between aromatization and the severity of that virus. Really? Um, so again, that's a that was a pretty big study that was done. I can, I'll send you the published version. Yeah, I can't, I don't want to say the names of these things, but um, mm -hmm. it shows that the, worse the outcome the higher the aromatization it was only in men wow. so again it there's clearly a problem going on and i guess mm -hmm. the it's it clearly is detrimental to your health too the faster you aromatize the more you aromatize right testosterone right. and estrogen you know it's clearly causing a problem and it's probably something like our food that's doing this to us for sure and, and that's it's so multi like it's also could be mediated by childhood obesity and um yep. you know okay. rates of even just we, even just on the higher end of uh infant body fat like children these days are more fat even if they're not obese oh, than they've been in the past so even that little precipitation of increased processed food intake when you're a child or just having excess weight might be a, a causal factor too yeah or which came first right i mean the yeah clearly the crap food is causing yeah. the, I mean, <laughs> you know and you're 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 not you're not old but you're you're old enough to remember like when you were a kid though kids weren't heavy right no. you were like the last generation of that right Everyone my was... children 
my children are are on the thinner side and they're like the only kids. Like we go to the pool, they're the only kids who like you can yeah. still see because my son has like veins on his stomach at eight. Yeah. Like that's not common anymore. Right? Kids are so what is it the food? I, I it's I'm just proposing so is it the food or is it the est like what's doing it first? It's probably the food destroys it first, the estrogen goes up, which makes it even worse. Yeah. Right? It's just like cyclical around and around and around right. or something. But there's definitely right. something wrong. Right. And and then yeah, I mean, we know that there's also like and this research is pretty pretty good too by uh oh, I'm gonna forget his name now. He he does a lot of research on on the gut microbiome and, and surprisingly we don't know much of it. Um oh my gosh, he's a, a great researcher. I can't believe I'm forgetting this. I'll have to I could text you, you after this, but yeah, I'm um, sending you the the one on the virus now. I'll text okay, you after. Perfect, thank you. He uh he did this study where he basically compared um, people who consume a lot of, and people actually might know this. I think it's James something. I can't remember. And I've looked at a lot of his research, but he did this one study where he compared people who consume a lot of vegetables, just generic vegetables with, uh, a group who just ate, uh, low intakes of vegetables, but high intakes of fermented foods. So like kefir, uh, sauerkraut, mm -hmm. things of that nature and measured their, their gut diversity. And what he found was that the groups of people who actually consumed more vegetables had higher inflammation and less diversity. The group that ate a moderate amount of vegetables but ate more uh, ferments had greater diversity and lower inflammation, which is super, super interesting. But point being is that I think, um, you, you know, there's a lot of metabolic effects that you have as an outcome from having a certain distribution of microbiota. And your, your short chain fatty acid production, acetate, and all these things can affect uh, uh, end fates of certain nutrients as well. Those short chain fatty acids have a large play there, insulin sensitivity, and all of that. So, um, you know, it's it's really tough because I think a lot of people, also a lot of people, start out the bodybuilding thing in hopes to improve their health because maybe they had bad digestion they're coming from a place where they had bad digestion and so now they're entering it and it's it's probably improving symptom symptomatically but there's still underlying issues there that aren't being helped because also we don't have that diverse of a diet i mean most bodybuilders aren't eating fermented foods right yeah it's chicken and rice and, and maybe some broccoli which is a whole another thing of an, in and of itself and in that limiting alone can cause autoimmune issues. I mean, I, I had, I've had many cases of one in particular, uh, a gal named Helen. She was an IFBB pro bikini girl, and she um, developed a massive autoimmune disorder to chicken. And it was because she had been competing for 25 years, and oh, she all she had ate was chicken. And so now every time she ate chicken, her throat swelled up, oh. her face would get puffy, like she literally couldn't eat chicken. Um, so it's like you're you're trading one battle for another. I know I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but no, it's, this you, is all relative. Yeah, you, you just I think you know what bodybuilders need to look at. I guess is this whole thing of digestion. It, it's it, you hear it so much, and it matters a lot. But what you need to be doing isn't necessarily taking the the, the most expensive probiotic or using Metamucil at a higher dose or or what have you. Sometimes it's literally just um looking at what you're eating maybe spreading out meals like something as simple as just spreading out meals a little bit 30 minutes and then possibly placing in foods that are a little bit abnormal in the bodybuilding realm fermented foods for example sauerkraut i love yep. fermented beets yep. because you yeah. also get nitrates um I, I love dark chocolate because you get nitrates i love 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 kefir it's it's one of my favorite products for bodybuilders to to consume because you get calcium and i find that most bodybuilders are deficient in calcium it's That's wild awesome. right yeah it's like the craziest thing it's we milk anymore. <laughs> um so i you know like if you can consume those things in conjunction with practicing a better lifestyle not just as like a a human being that just shovels food all day I think you have a solution to a large problem in bodybuilding overall. Yeah, it, there was a study again. I'm I'm going to miscite it, but there was a study similar to what you were talking about. They were English researchers, and they wanted to study the gut microbiome, and they went to some village in Africa where they would. It was it was supposed to be the most uh, currently surviving primitive group of humans on the planet yeah, they basically yeah, yeah. Lived like our ancestors did from forty thousand years ago and they measured their gut biome right when they left england 
what they measured what it was atrocious and then after spending six months or eight months or whatever it, outside eating this stuff and they went they documented everything they ate and it was so diverse they ate like eighty thousand species of just birds right and then of plants you know a hundred you know daily it was over a hundred different types of plants they ate all of these things they never washed their hands they thought it was fascinating because they would go to the bathroom right you're you're outside you're living like right. primitive man you went to the bathroom you dusted off your hands and you cooked food or whatever you didn't yeah. there was no concern about germs and they actually got healthier and then when they got back to england they tested them again after a few months and their gut bio went back to junk again yeah yeah that's super interesting right because i think one of the reasons that the sort of industrialized populations are a bit more unfortunately unhealthy i think is is because of the over sterilization of their environments and i think a kid needs to get dirty and gets get in the mud i think a kid needs to get licked in the face by a dog or a cow or like, you know, fucking <laughs> the weirdest shit. But I think totally. like people need to get dirty and be okay with it, you know. And I've again, this is like I'm a bad representation because I've not been sick for as long as I can remember. Like it's been so so long, and I'm sick now. But I did have like wild circumstances the past couple of weeks. But it's uh, it's I've just never been sick like other people have been sick, and I don't yeah. usually care about those. Like no, I with don't. You use hand sanitizer excessively nope. i don't use you know when i'm when i'm uh showering or anything i don't use like antiseptics antibacterial agents it's and it's not because i'm like carnivore or anything like that it's just because i don't think it's necessary to no, not necessary. do that yeah no i think so, you're making it worse right yeah right and i, I mean you kill 99 percent of bacteria that one that other one percent is going to get a hell of a lot more keen on what you're more. using to try to kill them and yeah. And all that bacteria is not necessarily harmful that you're killing yeah. in your hand. Yeah. Right. That's you don't know thing. that. I mean, how do you, you're just summing up a large group of things and just destroying right. it for no reason. I, I know really that. Think. And that that's what happened during that, again, during that thing that occurred for a couple yeah. of years there. I mean, everyone was obsessed with this stuff. I've yeah. always avoided again with the kidney thing. I'm not supposed to use stuff like that. Cause it, it gets just, it'll, it gets right. excreted by the kidney. So I'm supposed to avoid things like that. So I've always avoided all those harsh chemicals and stuff mm -hmm. are just not needed. And I'm, I'm like right. you, I get sick once every three years maybe. And it's generally yeah. just a cold, right? Like I'm just run down. I've been waking up at four 30 in the morning to coach people and going to bed at 11. I'm just not sleeping. Right. Yeah. You know, it's gonna It's bound to happen. Yeah. It happens Something. every once in a while, especially but like you. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I very rarely am I ill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and an interesting uh, constituent of that is mouthwash, you know, antiseptic mouthwash. There it, it, a really good data on this, and not many people talk about it because it's a big industry. But you know, mouthwash is causal to hypertension. Antiseptic mouthwash is causal nitrate because oxide. you're destroying the nitrate creating yep. I'm you bacteria understand. in your mouth. You know, so it's like this stuff isn't just generically good for you. And I think a lot of people. I did a video on multivitamins recently. I posted on my YouTube, and I think well, that's another one where people think it's just generically good for you. But you look at the true randomized controlled studies, the meta-analysis done on over hundreds of thousands of people, it turns out doesn't really make a difference at all. If anything, it actually negatively impacts individuals because they're getting an abundance of, you know, vitamin E whilst also smoking, you know, or something like that. And that's totally. causing or perpetuating more lung cancer. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's, you know, sometimes it's counterintuitive, but you don't want to be too hyper sanitary. No, 100%, right? And, there's, and I'm sure there was times our ancestors went through, right? Not just lack of food, but lack of nutrients for certain things, right? And it's okay, the body adjusts these things over time, right? You don't need, right? In the winter, we were going to be low on vitamin D, right? In right. the summer, we were going to have more. It's right. it, it didn't kill us. Yeah. You know? it it just, said, arguably, it made us stronger, you know? Probably. And you net out, you net out, yeah, you net out stronger from these periods of you know feast and famine like you're saying so with the food maybe it's not about maybe it's not about chicken rice every two hours maybe that's not the right strategy maybe if your only concern is to look a certain way it's the way to do it but maybe if you're trying to do this long term maybe that's not the right way like i want to be doing this in some capacity and i don't mean getting on stage but looking a certain way until i'm old yeah right you know, for 70s sure. 80s whatever i don't want to I don't, I don't think there's any reason to sacrifice that and maybe taking better care of your insides yeah with this stuff the way to do yeah. that you know we're already using toxic stuff like we talked about before you know potentially yeah, harmful chemicals as yeah. well. and and you know this, this is getting dangerously close to uh 
I'm spacing on the term here. When you like, kill a certain genetic group of people off because you want to oh, certain yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> e e eugenics. Yeah, eugenics. But you know, we weren't designed to be taken care of if there was direct no, flaws within the system. And I, I do believe that like this abundance of care has led to an abundance yes, of 100 changes in epigenetics and things that allow things to survive capable. yeah exactly and and unfortunately again that's cancer obesity diabetes yeah. like cardiovascular disease everything is inclining like a motherfucker and causally probably because of this overabundance of care but also under nourishment and you know all these different things. over yeah, overfed, overfed, people, overfed but undernourished. Yeah. yeah and well, it, it, do you ever different. look at you ever look at actin the gene actn yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a kind of a cool example, right? So on both ends of the spectrum, they're both considered elite, right? Like the marathon, the Olympic marathon runner and the Olympic sprinter are both elite athletes. One is acting two, one is acting three, but they're both equally as rare. Most people fall somewhere in the middle, but when I guess we look at morphology, the way we developed as humans, we were one or the other extreme, right? Those are the only ones that lived, mm -hmm. depending on where you were born and what your environment was. If you were in the middle, you die. Like you just couldn't physically right. survive <laughs> and your immune system's tied to these things and right. all these other, you know, it, but that goes to that too. And because of, again, not, I'm not preaching eugenics at all, but it's yeah. because of modern medicine and healthcare and all these other things that are prolonging lives. And then yeah. these traits are perpetuating. It's we're carrying on as a society kind of in the, this like shitty middle of the bell yeah. curve place. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting what that might end out to be in a couple of years. And I think, what's what's good to think about though in this instance is like people like you or i who do take tremendously good care of ourselves that those the way i think about it in, even if we are using androgens i don't think that's going to have much of an epi i think we talked about this before epigenetic effect on the transgenerational things but you know uh, diabetics for instance have there's a, a transgenerational effect to the epigenetics of all of their children for the next 10 generations you know they've done this in mice so I think what's fortunate is that if we can take good care of ourselves and do the blood work in lab, and I guarantee my, my blood work is better running a gram of gear than the guy to the left or right oh, of me on, on the bus. Um, and if we can take care of that and, and harbor it in a, a way that's going to be preserved, I think beneficially ourselves as well as the people that we hopefully inspire and grow out of us the in the future will not be a part of that group. And ideally, you don't have to face these problems, but that's the hope. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, 100%. I see it. You, you don't have kids yet, right? No. You, I think you'll see it in your children. My, you know, my children are never sick. They get early adequate sleep and they eat <laughs> properly, you know, but the same yeah. kind of stuff, like it's diversified. It's not just, you know, obviously, if we're prepping for something, there's the food right. gets more boring, but it's it, all these things do matter and you can see the outcome and you'll see it in your children too, how. Their level of health is a different place than that's, a lot of the, you know, their right. peers. My my that's, children's friends are sick all the time. That's one thing I'm actually really interested to have kids yeah. about. And, and you'll, you'll you will I guarantee you will see it firsthand. Yeah, I know my I son. A, it, it's kind of embarrassing, but I have like a 180 page document on like uh, prenatal, postnatal you really? research. Yeah, <laughs> like, and I like prepared this in in hopes that like you know, if I do have the child, like what is the exact, and I'm not going to be like hyperbolic. Yeah, on this well, you can get close. What is the exact protocol that they need to be doing to be like 100%, like given the best opportunity in life, cognitively and physically as possible. Like I want to ensure that that is not an issue for them, you know? Yeah, it's just, yeah. I mean, but you will see it. And it's funny because even just like you and I, if you hit it 80%, you're, you're better than, yeah, you know, you, yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be to the letter with this stuff, but you're it is really interesting. Yeah, it just, and it'll be interesting to see as they grow old, where that takes them versus, yeah. you know, the alternative. I know, like, not to keep going with it, but like my children haven't had fast food or soda. That's not something that we yeah. eat. Mm -hmm. They've never had McDonald's. I think right. my son had Domino's once, which is I, I, most people wouldn't even do that fast food. He saw a commercial and he was. He was fascinated by the advertising, which again is disgusting. <laughs> that they, like, make little kids interested in this stuff. And right. so we ordered it for him so he could try it. He ate half a slice. And oh, really? He was, he was like, so no. gross. And he'll eat regular pizza on occasion, but he he was so disgusted by the wow. taste of it because it doesn't That's taste impressive. like it's all fake ingredients. So yeah. 
this isn't what I thought it was. Right. Like yeah. you knew better than to eat it. That's so, and, and it's interesting you say that because I think like foundationally, we know what is good and not good for us because if you think in that kind of original mind where it's like you're a child, you don't eat the things that, like you don't eat vegetables, for example, that have high loads of, you know, phytic chemicals, which could be yeah. carcinogens, like, you know, raw broccoli, for instance. No kid likes to eat raw broccoli, but there's a there's a pretty good reason for that. You have tons of oxalates, you have tons of, you know, and doesn't digest well. Yeah, just right. <laughs> Not good for a, a person in general. And I think this is true for that. Like when you taste <clears throat> real cheese, you know, again, I was just in, I hate to say it again, but I was just in Bosnia and everybody and their their grandmas like always make cheese. Like they make their own cheese and you taste that and cool. you compare it to anything you buy in an American store and you're like, what the fuck is this shit? Like it's yeah. not even close, you know? No. So it's, it's, uh, it, the difference is really, really interesting in, in the, the gap between American children and like very, very uh, varieties of other children across different continents. But I think it's it's good to know that like you're taking care of your kids in a way. And I, I fundamentally want to have the same kind of principles where, for instance, like a, a birthday party, I don't want it to be like about cupcakes and candy and cakes. Like I'd, I would rather spend like a thousand dollars on a gold encrusted steak for my kid than like have this be like the most wild and extra, you know what I mean? Like that stuff would be way more meaningful for me as a parent and i think it would be more enjoyable for them and again not perpetuating this sort of like eat process stuff as a reward and sort of you know blah 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 but yeah i mean and you'll see and i know you're going to do the same stuff it's just it, and it doesn't take that much effort that's the funny thing and nor yeah. is it that much more expensive than eating feeding them shit like if you looked at the price right. of some of these fast food stuff it's oh mind-blowing how expensive yeah. it is I'm yeah. not even sure people afford to eat that stuff, right? <laughs> no. It's for me to buy, go to the butcher and buy different meat fresh or buy different fish fresh every day and fresh vegetables and things than it is for me to go through a drive-thru. Yeah. Oh, God. Deep fried. Yeah. God knows We went what. out for a, a cheap meal, like, because it was, you know, in, we were gone for two weeks and then we were in Thailand for two weeks before that. So there's no fast food chains, like, in either of those places. Like, there's no, like, food that's American out there. In, in Thailand, you have some, but not many, not many at all. Um, and, and in Bosnia, and we went to Serbia and Croatia and, and, and Turkey, nothing, like no American foods. So we got back and we're like, man, we want to eat some shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's been a while since we've had some fucking shit. And we got to go, like, get uh, Steak and Shake, which is a place out here in Texas. And it was, it's a fast food chain. And it was like $60 for like a couple, like, sides, Brothers. diet pops and then a couple burgers you know two burgers each and it was just like what the fuck man? 60 dollars. yeah like i was like this is crazy you know i yeah it's interesting wow yeah i know it's it's almost like i'm not sure who they're even marketing toward with those prices right, right? because right. you're not really going for i'm not insulting i don't think they're going for super educated people right no. that's not really yeah. what the fast food market is they're they're preying on people that don't have another choice or don't know better, mm -hmm. and at that price though, if you're unfortunately there is a there's generally a correlation between income and intelligence. If yeah, how are they affording that stuff? Right, right. Which is maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it'll drive them to not <laughs> use that <laughs> yeah, yeah. anymore, and these companies go yeah. out of business. Yeah, hopefully, you know? that's the hope. Um, one thing I did want to mention that I I totally forgot, um, which I think is important is. No, are you familiar with naltrexone at all? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So um, naltrexone at a high dose is, you know, not something I would really delve into. But um, for individuals who are experiencing low bowel movement regularity, so they're not having maybe bowel movements usually about one to three times a day, or or maybe sometimes more, depending on the excess calories you might be eating, or you're feeling like you have that. Um, you know, you're not evacuating all the way when you do have a bowel movement. There's still something left okay. of your that gut is descended. Um, low dose naltrexone therapy is actually a really, really positive uh, therapy to both treat things like leaky gut, GERD, but also it's a prokinetic molecule, so it will enhance that peristalsis and, and and actually have food go through you in a manner that it's supposed to. So let's say okay. that migrating motor complex is not necessarily as efficient as it could be. One, an individual could use low-dose naltrexone, which is, I believe is 
um, a milligram basically a day and have a foreseeable improvement in that process. Okay. So um, it's something that I, I, we work with an HRT clinic called Rise HRT, and that's something we commonly will deploy for really? individuals. Yeah. It, and I think it's really not spoken about too much, but there's a lot of good research on it. Like it's not something that's um, obscure at all. And it's, it seems to be very effective for people, even in longer term scenarios where they're, um, you know, I, I would almost prefer someone, especially if they're not having bowel movements, they're in pain, they're in chronic um, kind of constipation or diarrhea, take a low dose naltrexone protocol and have it fixed, even if it's not addressing the mainline issue, to have the the quality of life improvement from that alone yeah. is, is well worth it. So yeah, I think that's one thing that doesn't get perpetuated enough out there and low dose naltrexone therapy is cheap, effective and wildly safe. So really, okay. Yeah. I didn't know anything about that. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. 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 And unfortunately it's, I feel like the gut stuff is a big deal, right? That's why we made this video, mm -hmm. right? We're both running into it with All clients often. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's, it's, yeah, it, it, hopefully it, it can turn around and we can fix this stuff, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it starts, I think just with better decisions, like you were saying, spacing food out, yeah. better food choices, better variety of food. Right. You know? Right. Um, I think, you know, the, it, what's tough here is speaking on, you know, economical times, I think it's, it's getting harder for individuals to afford coaches. And so you have a lot of people doing this on their own, which coaching is a luxury. So it makes complete sense. Yep. But <clears throat> speaking from my own sense, I have competed, done preps myself. I have, mm -hmm. you know, coached myself through off season as I am now. And you can kind of lose your mind. Like you, you can make some pretty wacky yeah, decisions, sure. yeah. if just completely irrational, just because in, in your head it seems rational. And and so it sounds like a simple solution. Space out meals, maybe take one fasting day a week, even intermittent fast. Um, you know, maybe change the food orientation around so you're not eating like a heavy fat meal right before bed, which is when the mm -hmm. the migrating motor complex happens. So during it's, that, it's slow that down. Yeah. So you disrupt the whole process because you ate like 30 grams of fat because you backloaded it because you didn't want to have it around <laughs> your nose. Because you, the carbs at night are somehow going to affect, yeah, you know, exactly, the money exactly. you're injecting it. Right. It, and it's like you just the simple solutions are sometimes the, the easiest ones and the ones that will also provide the, the largest amplitude of effect. Because um, it can be really easy to get in your head and be like, maybe I need to change this like really obscure thing. Sometimes it's just like not even that extremely complicated. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm with you on the coaching thing. I, I was always self coached. The outcome wasn't mm -hmm. what I was looking for, right? Because you yeah. make wacky decisions. And I, I don't know if I ever, mine in the off season were probably just I wasn't eating enough. Like I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. always, enough. Yeah. I made bad decisions during prep, though, right? Like you look at yourself and you always. look flat and you're like more cardio, less cardio, more food, less food. What am I doing? Right. right? And you end up doing three hours of cardio a day and coming in yeah. and horrible <laughs> for just yeah. bad decisions. Right. right? And that's, I think that that's why, you know, that's why I enlisted Paul's help for this upcoming mm -hmm. season is just so I don't have to think about that stuff. Like, like right. guys like you and I do this day in and day out for other people. I don't need to think about my own food. Yep, I don't exactly. want to think about my own food and I'd rather bounce it off, you know, and, and like we talked about earlier in the video, like we're in, you and I are in a group of like close knit guys. Like I'd yeah. rather bounce ideas off of you or, chase or any of those guys like you know and i because i know paul and i do that as well like we'll send each other photos of things and we'll like mm -hmm. different ideas like what do you think about this like how do i get rid of that or you know yeah, what yeah. Is the strategy here like i feel like that's kind of the cool thing about our our little community is that we're all you know able to feed off each other with that stuff and i don't know most people don't have access to that information right you right know, and it's it's super it's super nice it's it's like uh it is weird, but as a coach, at some point, it's less about, and I talked about this in my story too recently, but it's less about the technical work and it's more about the intro relational work, you know, talking about cooling someone's nerve or find, figuring out where their weak point lies within their personality so you can catch it before it gets yeah. too late. And it's, and I've been on that same boat where it's like in my last prep, it was that exact same thing. I was as lean as I have ever been, and I thought that was the solution to win, but I was so lean that I like, I was emaciated. I was 206 pounds for me. I'm 6'2". That's I mean, pretty small. Yeah. That's pretty small. And, that's, and that's 10 pounds like, less than I weigh. And I'm 5'7". You, 
you could put you in and at, at that point you could put your fingers in the serrations <laughs> serrations and like glutes like yeah you could literally insert them and like run them down the striation but it was like it wasn't worth it you know I, I just went off the rails and i just like okay i'm gonna lower more because i look flat and i'm, I'm like looking back and just like why did i and make someone that look at your photos and been like, right what you it's like what was i doing you know yeah. um and it's it's really important even if it's just like a third eye from like you said friends or someone who you trust it's like uh hana my significant other has like a really good eye for this shit right now where i'm like i don't know if i should increase food or you know i don't know if i should maybe keep things the same and she'll be like you you've been looking pretty much the same way it's been stable this entire week why don't you increase food i'm like you're right what am i yeah, doing because right, you can't think about it like right objectively when you look at yourself <laughs> at all when right. even and on an and i know that i have a newer client who i know is going to watch this video which is such a cool thing when your clients watch all yeah, of your stuff i love it uh which is wild because i don't know if i would watch all my stuff but <laughs> I, I, you know, i've been watching all my stuff um it, just even so, stuff like i my goal with him is just to simplify his life like when he came to me he was using a ton of stuff that he just didn't need to be using supplements yeah. and vitamins and all sorts of stuff oh, and yeah. his life is very cluttered and it seemed to me like it was a, a full-time job just to manage all of that and it's kind of mm -hmm. cool like even, that's not even bodybuilding related he's a lifestyle client but just to clean up that stuff so he's not like constantly burdened with all this right. stuff right and that's right. kind of a role that you and i play in people's lives it's like you're a like personal assistant yeah, that's a really good point. Actually, yeah, we're we're sort of the organizers of the misconstrued information that might be out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Be like, well, that supplement doesn't do anything, so we don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> there is absolutely no need to take ten thousand milligrams of vitamin C. Yeah, no or, you know, and I think, healthy, but <laughs> yeah, and there's you know, I work with guys that are you know, or they're injecting things 12 times a day 10 oh times my god like, i just i couldn't imagine like i'm not needle adverse but i just at a certain yeah, point I'll pass. i've had enough right no. yeah there was a time where oh man i remember this is like uh almost embarrassing but there was a time when i was like this had to have been three or three or four years ago and i was so i was injecting obviously my androgens daily um so that's one pin growth hormone twice daily once in the morning and once um before bed okay. well carnitine separately because i didn't do it in the same syringe at all for whatever reason and then i would do three injections in each tricep of hydrolonic acid like one milliliter of hydrolonic acid okay. so that's six other injections <laughs> and then on top of that i would do insulin in the morning lantus and then humalog pre-workout and then humalog post-workout so i was pinning myself like like you said, like 14, 16, 17 times a day. And I was like, what the fuck am I like madness. this shit, total madness, dude. you know? And like the hydrolonic acid didn't do shit for me. I know. It's yeah. like <laughs> I know. But be touchy, right. Talk to me about something else. If you, if you have a couple more minutes, I'm curious yeah. your thoughts on L carnitin. So where, where I'm confused here is, and I'm looking at it purely from like a physiology point of view, it's not the rate limit in fat loss, right? When you look at the Krebs cycle, it's acetyl coenzyme A is at the top. That's the mm -hmm. rate limit in order for the Krebs cycle to go around. Where I'm confused is, you're probably too young to remember this, but there was a supplement company in the 90s. Lee Priest was a spokesperson for them. I'm not going to disgrace any companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to sell different parts of the Krebs cycle as supplements, claiming that oh, it would give you more energy and stuff. I know EIS did that back in the day as well. Yeah, I can say that because EIS is defunct. Um, yeah. What is your thoughts on L-carnitin? I get the androgen receptor possibility there, but as far as like a, I, a lot of guys are injecting, you know, six, I use six, you know, milligrams of it, uh, milliliters a day. It just seems like yeah. a lot of volume for what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any effect <laughs> at that high, okay. high, or beneficial effect, anything going on that's necessary for six milliliters a day. <clears throat> I do think there is, you know, a, a slight, the way I look at it is you're not getting any extra fat loss. So when I take L-carnitine, I'm not looking at it for like okay. the, the fat loss component or like I'm going to in, improve beta oxidization. It's not relevant to that for me. It's actually more about if there is potential like androgen receptor density, hopefully it can be upregulated. So the requirement of gear is maybe 5% less. I don't even know if that's truly happening because really my requirements are the same for my whole life. And I've used it pretty much my whole bodybuilding career. What I will say is important to me is the myocardium effect. So it seems that when 
you people enter heart failure and they're treated with L-carnitine in clinical environments, it's actually really effective at repairing heart tissue or at least improving the outcomes of heart failure um, or low ejection fractures. And so for me, it's not necessarily kind of like Lantus. It's not necessarily a performance enhancing compound or anything of that nature, but it's actually more of a, a yeah, prophylactic means to caring for my health and heart. And I, I feel like perceivably I might get a little bit of a better um, cognitive function off of it. Uh, okay. just especially in in a facet administration in the morning with like a little bit of caffeine to dust okay. glucose but yeah i gotta have you back on or i gotta come on your channel because i think we could go on with this stuff for hours this yeah great. I, i'd be happy to be back whenever man this is i love honestly for me talking with you talking with paul talking with everyone just like talking with my like closest friends and it's like the the highlight i have there's not many i have very controversial opinions on a lot of things but one of them is friendships I don't waste time with a lot of people because I just simply don't think there's, and it's not that I'm like antisocial, but I just, I think that there's a lot of people who spend time with people just to spend time. And I, I think when someone has value as a person and I j like kind of like learning when I find interest towards them, it's like, I I'm attracted to being around them, talking to them, discussing more with them and having intellectual conversations. And that's a friendship to me. It's not necessarily yep. just something you do. So when I'm hanging out with you guys on these podcasts, it's like so much fun. This is the highlight of my day. You know? I hope people appreciate that and they at least yeah. see that. What is, I think the the background thing for Colton and I is is kind of odd too, because I've known you for only a couple months, but I think we, yeah. we got into that stuff really deep initially. Like, I feel like we were going back and forth on really weird, deep content. Like I was yeah. helping you with some content for your clients. Right. You're talking about keg repeats and yeah. yeah, it was just like, but like really bizarre stuff that most people don't talk about. Right. And this was like right. the stuff you and I were geeking out about like for right. an hour. Yeah. You know, same, as, you know, same as Todd and I do that same stuff too. We just <laughs> the most Todd's really good things that no one cares about. Yeah. <laughs> um, no one trying to figure it out. And that's something else I appreciate about is about you and, and Paul and stuff is I think you also help me think in a more, in, in a more clear way. Right. Like, Todd always tells me I think bottom up, but you guys think top down. Yeah, but you think more. You think more similar to me, I think. But I just, it, yeah, I think it helps so. the audience though to like see different points of view on these things because we're coming from the same place and we arrive at the same place. But just to you know hear a different person elaborate on this stuff is kind of cool. Yeah, I agree. Very cool. cool well, cool. I appreciate you being on here. I'll put his. Yeah. Um, so you're obviously a coach, and you have quite a website and quite a presence online. Um, do you want to talk about your website and any, you know, honestly, um, it's my whole spiel is a little bit different. So I guess it is cause I never have really talked about it actually ever before. Um, but, but how I coach people is a lot different in the sense that I, it's a lot more hands on. So, um, I take less clients, but I do way more for those few clients. So, um, I guess what, what I do is try to scale that method with multiple people. So I run a coaching business. I'm kind of like the CEO and the main coach, but I have other people who I sort of mentee, mentor, and they also work directly hand in hand with me. And then we kind of coach people together. And so it's like this group effort of multiple intellects plugging into several different individuals, trying to get the best out of them. Um, so we're always kind of taking on people, but it is a little bit of a different coaching style than what's I think typically conveyed. Um, and some people don't like it. Some people love it. So it's kind of to each their own, but yeah, I mean, if you guys just want to follow me on Instagram or YouTube at, uh, Instagram is just Colton underscore red and YouTube is just Colton Lucas, my name. Um, I would be happy to just get more followers and hopefully provide yep. any more content I can of value for sure. Yeah. And we'll put, I'll put your, your link tree and stuff down below. Yeah, please. Thank uh, you. But no, you, you're a great friend of mine. Thank you. And, you know, sure. I hope to do more stuff with you in the future. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Well, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Thanks, Kurt.